Good morning. Thank you for coming. Welcome to today's oversight hearing on CUNY's efforts to reduce costs associated with rising textbook prices. My name is Inez Barron, Council Member Inez Barron, and I am the Chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Today's hearing is an update to an earlier hearing we held on September 30th, 2014. During that hearing, I expressed my concerns regarding students burdened by increasing tuition costs coupled with high textbook prices. It was clear the increasing cost of textbooks were forcing many students to figure out how they could also pay for required textbooks for their courses. Unfortunately, since the last hearing, textbook prices have not decreased. Today, the price of one textbook can cost $200 and sometimes as much as $400. In fact, according to the Consumer Price Index, CPI, the price of textbooks rose 181% from 1998 to 2016. That is a remarkable increase when compared to the CPI of recreational books, which decreased by 4.2%. According to the National Association of College Stores, the average price of a new textbook increased from $57 in 2007 to $82 in 2014. Even the cheaper alternatives to new textbooks, used textbooks, saw their prices increase from $49 to $59. Those high textbook costs have forced students to use their financial aid money to buy books. In 2015, a 2015 survey found that 30% of the students indicated that they relied on their financial aid to cover 70% of their textbook expenses. These high textbook prices have a disproportionate impact on community college students, on community college students, where 65% of these students use their financial aid to cover their entire textbook expenses while 50% of the students at four-year colleges use their financial aid to cover their entire textbook expenses. Of the 30% of students using financial aid for their textbook expenses, the average amount was over $300 per semester. In community, in community college, that amount adds up to $1,200 and $2,400 at a four-year college. However, that total cost translates to higher interest payments for students who have to borrow money for college. A student in community college who borrows $1,200 will accrue $277 in interest, while the four-year student who borrows $2,400 will incur $555 in interest payments on average. For a student who is working their way through school, that would have, they would have to work close to 28 hours in a minimum wage job to buy a $200 textbook. To buy $600 worth of textbooks per year, that student would have to work an additional two hours per week for the entire year. Those extra hours do not account for the cost of living in addition to other necessary expenses such as food and transportation. In response to the high cost of textbooks, some students opt not to buy textbooks because they simply can't afford it. An overwhelming majority of the students who made this decision did so while acknowledging that failing to purchase the required text could have a negative impact on their grade. Additionally, students also allow the price of the assigned textbook to influence their decision on whether to enroll in a particular course or how many courses they were going to take in a semester. Either decision prevents students from taking a full course load, which can result in more years in school and may increase the likelihood that they will not graduate on time or even graduate at all. While CUNY still offers the most affordable college education in the New York City metropolitan area, students have had to contend with a 45% increase in tuition at community colleges and 31% at senior colleges, with a 3% in increase expected over the next five years. By 2021, students at senior colleges will be paying $7,330 per year. In addition to tuition, students also have to pay various fees that range from $15 to $180. Thus, for, community, for CUNY students, many of whom come from families making less than $30,000 a year, expensive textbooks can severely limit their chance of graduating. 
While students may receive financial assistance via PAL and TAP, these programs are based on a student's family income and are not always enough to cover the full cost of attending college. More notably, not all CUNY students are eligible for financial aid, and many have to pay for tuition and expenses associated with going to college out of their pockets. This is one of the main reasons why I criticize Governor Andrew Cuomo's Excelsior Scholarship, which failed to take into account the additional expenses, such as textbooks, that make it difficult for students to graduate from college. We must do better to ensure our students have access to the essential tools they need to succeed. During today's hearing, I'm interested in learning more about CUNY's initiatives to address the increasing costs of textbooks. I'm particularly interested in CUNY's use of Open Educational Resources, OER, which, is, which, it, which CUNY indicated it had started to implement at the last hearing. I would also like to know how CUNY is utilizing the $4 million which it was given by the New York State Department of Education to invest in its OER initiative. I'm also interested in CUNY's progress with regard to implementing virtual bookstores across CUNY. During the last hearing, CUNY testified that the John Jay College of Criminal Justice was the only school that had replaced its brick and mortar bookstore with an online bookstore. I'm also interested in hearing from any textbook publishers that may be here today on their best practices to improve access and decrease the costs of their materials. And lastly, but perhaps most importantly, I would like to hear from CUNY students and to learn more about their experiences, what their experiences have been in dealing with the high cost of textbooks and which CUNY initiatives have worked in helping them to uh, have access to their required textbooks. I would not like to acknowledge my colleagues on the committee who are present and that's Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Additionally, I would like to thank my Chief of Staff, Joy Simmons, and my CUNY liaison, as well as Omawali Clay, who is my CUNY liaison, M. Indigo Washington, my Director of Legislation, Kiru Gichiru, the Committee Council, Chloe Rivera, the Committee uh, Policy Analyst, and Jessa, Jessica Ackerman, the Senior Finance Analyst to the Committee. Uh, now, in accordance with the rules, I will ask my counsel to uh, swear in the first panel, and that panel will be Vita Rabinowitz, Senior Vice Chancellor, Greg Greg, help me, Greg Goslin. Okay, from CUNY, Jean Amaral from BMCC CUNY. Maura Small from the New York, Col New York City College of Technology in CUNY. Okay. Thank you. And when you give your name, I'll try to get the correct pronunciations. I always think it's important to pronounce people's names the way they pronounce it. Thank you. Um, please raise your right hand when you're ready. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but your truth and your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. I am Vita Rabinowitz, the Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost of the City University of New York. I very much appreciate the opportunity to discuss with this committee the exciting work we are doing at CUNY around open educational resources and also to answer the chair's questions about the virtual bookstore and other um, affordability initiatives. I look forward to explaining why this work is so important to CUNY's access and excellence missions. With me today on the panel are Greg Gosselin, Interim University Dean of the Libraries and Information Systems, Jean Amaral, Assistant Professor and Outreach Librarian, 
who co-facilitates BMCC's Open Alternative Textbook Program, and Maura Smale, Chief Librarian and Professor from New York City Tech, uh, one of CUNY's three comprehensive colleges. Council members, before delving into the focus of our panel, I want to take this opportunity to thank the City Council, the Higher Education Committee, and you, Chair Barron, particularly for your extraordinary support of CUNY over the years, and in particular for your recent very generous support of CUNY's comprehensive remediation reform effort, the reform of our developmental education programs to bring them in line with best practices nationally is essential to our goal of improving access and degree completion for the 57% of CUNY students who begin their careers in remediation. And I look forward to talking with you at a later date about how we are investing these resources and what we expect to achieve with them. As you well know, as you just stated, another ba barrier to access, equity, and excellence in higher education is the prohibitive cost of college, to which the exorbitant cost of te textbooks is a major contributing factor. The issue of affordability is central to racial and socioeconomic disparities in academic achievement in the United States. As you know, Estimates are that by 2020, 65% of all jobs will require some kind of post-secondary credential, yet only 41% of the nation's 18 to 24-year-olds are pursuing post-secondary degrees that will prepare them for high-skilled high jobs. As Chair Barron stated, students spend between $1,000 and $1,200 annually on textbooks and supplies, which amounts to 14% of tuition for students in public four-year colleges nationally and 39% of the tuition in two-year colleges, according to the College Board. City University of New York's estimates are in line with those figures, with expected textbook expenditures of about 20% of tuition at CUNY's baccalaureate colleges and 27% of the tuition at our community colleges. For many CUNY students, the cost of textbooks makes them unaffordable and therefore unattainable, given that 40% of CUNY students come from households with annual incomes of less than $20,000 a year. Large-scale studies have reported, as Chair Barron noted, that many students choose not to register for courses with high textbooks and materials costs. And, a and as a result, they may not pursue majors, including majors in the sciences, that require expensive textbooks. Even if students start in these majors, they often end up withdrawing from or failing courses and changing majors because of the cost of the materials. Even for students who manage to borrow textbooks from libraries or other students, pass their courses and persist, challenges in paying for textbooks can lead to an increased number of years students spend in college, thereby reducing the likelihood that they will ever earn a degree. As a professor for many years at Hunter College, I observed firsthand in the 1980s and 1990s the effects of not buying textbooks on my psychology students. They often struggled to keep up their grades, and they did less well than they otherwise might have. They simply did not get the same education as other students, as I did when I was an undergraduate. They were not able to excel. It's very hard to earn very high grades when you don't have the foundational materials. And it, was, and it was harder for them to compete in their fields. Economically disadvantaged students need more supports, not fewer. Textbooks and other primary learning materials must be available to students by the first day of class and ideally before the start of the semester. For the last several years, CUNY has aggressively taken actions to help offset the burden of the high cost of textbooks for our students with a number of initiatives, including the Virtual Bookstore Initiative, of which you are aware, and 
um, of, of about which we are pleased to update you. In 2013 to 2015, as part of CUNY's textbook initiative and student financial aid initiative, $3 million was allocated uh, to purchase textbooks to place on uh, reserve in the library, as well as to purchase electronic books and other electronic materials. But libraries quickly realized that simply buying more textbooks to put on reserve, while that made a difference, um, was not adequate to meet the need. For example, such reserve books often have a four-hour loan period, which for many students was just not practicable. But a viable and scalable solution did present itself, open educational resources. OER are teaching, learning, and research materials that reside in the public domain, or they have been released under intellectual property license that permits free use and repurposing and updating by others. Awareness of OER began taking hold in academic uh, libraries at the beginning of this decade and at CUNY around 2011-2012. I have, to excite, um, I have to cite the extraordinary leadership of CUNY librarians in noticing this trend and sparking the movement at CUNY. Beginning in 2013, some li CUNY libraries began to divert their textbook funds, their normal allot allotments, into new OER efforts, primarily toward supporting faculty to adopt OER into their teaching practices. BMCC and City Tech were early adopters, hence their presence today at the panel, but there were others. In what began as an offshoot of the textbook initiative, some libraries continued to fund OER, in some cases with additional campus funding. These local efforts created the technological, logistical, and administrative know-how and the policies and practices for converting existing CUNY courses to OER and laid the groundwork for more widespread awareness and adoption. That preparation set the stage for two recent game changers that will be discussed in detail by Dean Gosselin. First, CUNY received a prestigious grant by the Hewlett Foundation and the Achieving the, G the Dream organization to create whole degree programs with no associated textbook costs. The second initiative, which was based in part on that success, was a major inv investment of $4 million from the state of New York that is changing the landscape of textbook availability and college affordability at CUNY. Just this week, colleagues, you may have seen a News 12 feature on the growing OER movement at Lehman College. Uh, it featured an interview of a student and a faculty member that points to the fact that the benefit of OER go beyond cost savings, although the savings to CUNY students from OER are already in the millions of dollars, with many more millions about to be saved if this works as planned. So what are these other benefits? They are academic. Our faculty are over the moon about this initiative. As the interview illustrates and our experience bears out, OER provides the opportunity uh, for faculty to engage in their teaching anew and a community of practice that helps them rethink their courses, refresh their pedagogy and their curricula. Uh, as they research options and see what's available, their passion for teaching is reignited. Even more importantly, numerous peer-reviewed studies report that the use of OER fosters student success. Students not only enjoy saving the money, and of course they do, but they also like the mix of materials and the new modes of learning that OER provides, the opportunity for more active and interactive learning, and the convenience of having access to materials any time from anywhere. 
So across the country, faculty enthusiasm and administrative support of OER use are evident in the growing number of conferences and skyrocketing attendance at those events. Established OER repositories are the sources of curated, peer-reviewed OER materials now available across the globe. Our chief librarian will talk about um, some of the quality uh, organizations like OpenStax, the Open Textbook Network from the University of Minnesota that will support our work. CUNY will continue to cultivate existing partnerships and seek new partnerships with OER providers and organizations in higher education. CUNY faculty are now excited about developing their own OER materials and texts specifically for CUNY students and CUNY courses. So council members, this movement in which CUNY is becoming a leader after a slow start um, will deliver on its promise to keep college more affordable and promote student success. For a more detailed accounting of where we are in OER implementation, I would like to turn now to the Dean of the Libraries, Greg Gosling. Thank you, Mr. Gosling. Thank you, Vita. Um, and thank you, Chair Barron, and you, the members of the ASEAN Committee on Higher Education. My name is Greg Goslin. I am the Interim University Dean of Libraries and Information Systems at CUNY. In February 2016, which was a very good year for us. Um, sure, sure. How's that? All right. In February of 2016, with backing from the Hewlett Foundation, the Achieving the Dream organization issued a request for proposals for community colleges to develop and deliver entire degree programs using only OER resources, materials that is. The CUNY Office of Library Services authored a proposal and coordinated participation of three community college partners, including the Bronx, Borough of Manhattan, and Hostos. Thankfully and deservedly, CUNY was selected and awarded $300,000 to create those Z degrees, or complete degree programs with no textbook costs. We're well on our way to degree program conversions in criminal justice, early childhood ed, and gen ed with a history concentration. Each degree program is converting approximately 25 courses, including all major requirements and a selection of gen ed requirements as well. Initially, 76,000 students will benefit. Once implemented, the courses in these zero-cost textbook degree programs will be available for instructors in similar programs across CUNY and the world to adopt and adapt as they wish. The ultimate goal is to scale these gen ed courses across all sections and then across colleges. The same goes for degree programs. This was the tipping point for OER at CUNY at the system level. It generated positive national press and as important awareness within CUNY academic units and administration of the benefits of OER in terms of cost savings and pedagogical innovation. The momentum generated by the Achieve the Dream initiative caught the attention of the university registrar who helped us fast track an implementation of the zero textbook cost course attribute in the university catalog, a very important development. This designation indicates a course that replaces costly textbooks with OER. As of spring 2017, CUNY students and their advisors can now search for their courses by this attribute. <coughs> and faculty can designate their classes this way from here on out. <coughs> As CUNY OER offerings begin to multiply, so too will the demand for them. As more faculty use this course attribute, we will be better be able to track OER activity and analyze and correlate that impact on student success and academic momentum as well as generate further awareness for instructors and students. The culmination of CUNY's groundbreaking work in OER was Governor Cuomo's $4 million tax levy support to CUNY's Office of Academic Affairs to establish support and enhance ongoing OER initiatives throughout CUNY. It is an acknowledgement of the work we have done and investment in the future and our potential to execute a bold vision. I would like to thank the governor and his team for making this historic investment. This funding must be spent in 2018 fiscal year. 
The short-term goal of the OER initiative is to reduce costs for students and accelerate their progress through college, but an important secondary impact is to change the culture to create systems and structures that connect curriculum and pedagogy to updated student learning outcomes. The expected result will be large-scale course conversions throughout the university, and that is what we intend to do. Institutionalize OER practices across the extraordinary mosaic that is CUNY. Funding for the CUNY OER initiative was awarded to the campuses based on proposals OAA solicited from the colleges. Preference was given to those plans that targeted high enrollment general ed classes or Z degrees, though we issued funding to every college that submitted a proposal. Campus funding includes generous allowances for faculty participation, institutional support, staffing, as well as training and professional development. Details of the initiative are available on the CUNY OER summary handout provided to you. Additionally, the CUNY Central Office will provide system-wide coordination, assessment, and the establishment of communities of practice, as well as facilitation of support and a variety of training options for the campuses. This includes on-site workshops, as well as CUNY-wide training events. This massive initiative, coupled with ongoing OER projects, has created the need for central office staffing in addition to campus staffing needs. To ensure that project goals get met and remain on track, it is imperative that central coordination is staffed appropriately. At present, all CUNY, all CUNY colleges with undergraduate programs are participating in OER initiatives. Awareness and enthusiasm have blossomed and cross-campus conversations have been enabled at every level. It's been an amazing year and we're truly just beginning. So too has our developing partnership with SUNY, also an Achieve the Dream participant and also the recipient of $4 million from Governor Cuomo. The Achieve the Dream grant sparked conversations between both our systems on how we may formally collaborate and support one another as we begin to change the paradigm on our campuses, as well as learn from each other. Our goals are to envision and develop a shared infrastructure and a web presence, consider and execute partnerships with agencies and technology partners in both higher education and vendor spaces, and to share statewide programming and professional development. We're close to realizing the goal, our first goal, of developing a shared OER services hub that will go live tomorrow. Also in the works is a shared OER catalog that will integrate into the services hub in joint partnership with OER Commons, a non-for-profit OER repository and digital publishing platform. We are also developing standards for peer review and research, data collaboration, discovery metadata, and lastly, aligning the assessment framework. It's been a most eventful year in support of CUNY's mission. I'll now pass the baton to Jean Amaral, my distinguished colleague at BMCC, who will share both their triumphs and experiences with OER. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the committee. My name is Jean Amaral, and I am an assistant professor and librarian at Borough of Manhattan Community College. I am also co-coordinator of BMCC's Open Alternative Textbook Program and other campus open educational resources initiatives. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you the progress that BMCC, as an example of one of CUNY's seven community colleges, has made in providing no-cost textbook options to our students since the fall 2014 textbook affordability hearing of this committee. BMCC has two campus-specific programs which address the barrier of expensive textbooks to our students' learning. One zero-cost option for students is BMCC's library's ongoing textbook reserve program. The library purchases every textbook that the campus bookstore stocks, as well as textbooks requested by faculty members, and makes them available to students for use in the library. In 2016-17, there were over 78,000 checkouts from the collection of more than 2,700 textbooks and recommended readings. While students are able to save money by accessing textbooks in the library, this is an imperfect solution that does not provide the 24-7 access afforded by most open educational resources, nor the pedagogical benefits we have seen when faculty redesign their courses, replacing commercial textbooks with OER. As you may know, the more important, or as you do know, <laughs> given the introduction today, um, the more important zero-cost option for our students is the availability of courses that use OER and other no-cost materials in place of expensive textbooks. At BMCC, we are very fortunate to have the wholehearted support of President Perez and Provost Karen Wilkes for our efforts in this area. 
Beginning in spring 2015, the MCC established its Open Alternative Textbook Program, through which faculty redesigned courses with open educational resources and other no-cost materials available online and through the library. Since the program's establishment, 75 faculty from 15 of 17 departments have participated in the program and redesigned over 50 courses, including more than 100 sections. With an investment of $80,000 used to support faculty participation, the program has saved approximately 6,750 students an estimated $1 million cumulatively from the program's launch through this fall semester. BMCC is building on the success of our Open Alternative Textbook Program with participation in the Achieving the Dream OER Degree Initiative. Beginning in fall 2018, all 20 courses required for the Criminal Justice Associate in Arts degree, BMCC's second largest degree program, will have at least one OER section offered and often more. For example, this fall, there are 24 OER sections across the six required criminal justice courses. Each student who enrolls in all of the OER sections for the degree um, will save an estimated $2,500 over the course of completing their program. BMCC is also receiving funds as part of the New York State Department of Education's recently funded 4 million OER initiative. Our faculty will be redesigning with OER and other no-cost materials 225 sections of 45 courses, 25 of which are high enrollment. Estimated savings per semester for students enrolled in these zero textbook cost courses is close to $850,000. Equally important, as we have heard, as the financial impact of OER courses is the pedagogical transformation that takes place when faculty redesign their courses with OER and other no-cost materials. In questionnaire responses, our faculty talk about being freed from the tyranny of the textbook, being more creative in their course design, adding interactivity and more current content, as well as aligning learning materials to learning outcomes and assessments. Students recognize this difference in their OER courses as well. Um, in a response to a survey question about the benefits of OER, students mentioned access to materials and learning more frequently than they did cost savings. They describe OER courses as being more engaging, more real world. Students also emphasize the positive impact on their potential to learn because they have access to materials on the first day of class and 24 seven throughout the semester, as many, though not all, OER are delivered online. It is clear that the pedagogical impact of OER courses is as significant, if not more, than the financial. I've provided a fact sheet that includes additional data and information, as well as quotations from students and faculty about the impact of OER courses. While we are very proud of our accomplishments at BMCC, we know that we have a long way to go in removing the barrier to learning that textbook costs pose for our students. In fall 2018, approximately 22% of BMCC's courses and 13% of course sections will be zero textbook cost, and 10% of faculty will have participated in training sessions. This is not enough when we have students choosing between textbooks that will help them succeed in their courses in buying groceries or Metro cards or paying bills. It's not enough when our students and faculty along with national research studies have told us about the positive impact OER have on learning and engagement. We can do more and will continue to seek the resources we need to support and grow BMC's OER initiatives. Some say that students should buy overpriced textbooks because they need to invest in their education. At BMCC, we believe in investing in our students. We believe they will succeed when barriers to their learning are removed, and that's what we're doing with OER. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Maura Smale. I'm Chief Librarian and Professor at New York City College of Technology, and I'm grateful to be here to discuss textbook affordability. Um, like our colleagues at BMCC, City Tech has been an early institutional leader in OER resource development at CUNY. Since 2014, the library has coordinated an OER fellowship for faculty, which pays them a stipend to convert course they, a course they teach and replace their textbook with an OER or other cost-free materials for students, for example, library resources. Our fellowship program, led by my colleague, Professor Kayleen Cooney, um, has involved 34 faculty members so far, and we've saved students nearly $240,000. 
City Tech has also been a leader in open source platform development at CUNY, and we host our OER on the City Tech Open Lab, which is an open digital platform for teaching, research, and collaboration that was originally funded by a Title V grant that the college received. Our prior work has well positioned us to participate in this year's state-funded OER initiative. We are significantly expanding our efforts this year, aiming to convert an, at least an additional 200 course sections to OER and impacting an additional 5,000 students minimum. We've also surveyed and interviewed students and faculty to learn more about their experiences with OER, and that's what I'd like to share um, today. So we've heard about students appreciating cost-free materials, which of course they do. They appreciate spending less money overall on textbooks and their course materials. City Tech students have told us that they cannot always afford to buy their textbooks, like many CUNY students. And as we know, and as you mentioned, Chair Barron, while students at CUNY senior colleges do report a slightly higher household income than at the community colleges, they are still economically constrained. 54% of students at the senior colleges receive Pell Grants, and 37% have a household income of less than $20,000. And of course, many of our CUNY community college students will transfer to the senior colleges and will bring their expectations of OER with them, likely. Our students also appreciate the time saved with OER. Our CUNY students are busy. Many have jobs, caregiving responsibilities, other commitments in addition to their academic work. In our interviews with students, we've heard about the strategies that they use to get access to their textbooks and to stay within their economic means, which can be surprisingly time consuming. They search for and order books online, which sometimes means they don't have the book until a few weeks into the semester. They buy used books from other students. They stand in line at the bookstore or in the library to get reserved books. Uh, a student told me that they take pictures of the relevant pages in the books of a classmate that they encounter in their class, or they just don't get the book at all. Uh, saving students time in getting their textbooks makes it easier for them to do their coursework and to be successful. Students also appreciate, as my colleague Jean mentioned, the easy access to course materials that OER offer. Since OER are hosted online, typically students have more flexibility in accessing the materials that they need. Um, our libraries do offer print textbooks on reserve, but they can only be used by one student at a time and only when the library is open. This flexibility allows students to work on assignments at their own convenience. While not all of our students have broadband internet access at home, most have smartphones, and the opportunities to access OER are growing, especially with increased Wi-Fi availability on subways and buses. For students who prefer to read their course materials on paper, our libraries do generally offer some free printing for them. One student mentioned to us that the OER saved her from developing back pain, a problem she has faced in the past when traveling with heavy textbooks, and others have shared their relief at not having to worry about the logistics of transporting a textbook to and from class, work, and elsewhere, which has helped them eliminate stress and complications while managing their complicated academic work and life schedules. Students and faculty also appreciate the range of content featured in OER. OER allow faculty to include an engaging range of course content, from text to image, images, video, audio, simulations, a far more diverse range of materials than a print textbook can provide, and without the high cost of a publisher-provided digital supplement. Updates to OER are easy to implement at no cost as well, in contrast to textbook edition updates every few years. This is an advantage that our City Tech faculty in particular have been quick to note, um, and is especially important for rapidly changing disciplines like the STEM fields. Again, at City Tech, this has been important for us. We have the highest number of STEM students across CUNY, over 78,000 as of fall 2016, 7,800, sorry. Um, at City Tech, our OER remain accessible to students even after their class has ended. Students in our biology department, for example, have access to their general biology course materials even as they progress through anatomy and physiology and molecular biology, which allows them to go back and review previous material as needed while they're in their later courses. And finally, students and faculty report increased engagement with OER. Surveys of students in our OER courses have been positive. They said that they preferred OER to a traditional textbook. Faculty have also noted that students were more engaged in their courses with OER as opposed to a traditional textbook. They have told us that students heavily annotate their printed OER pages, which they had not done with a textbook because they wanted to be able to resell that book. Um, they also, beyond the immediate and significant financial benefits, continue, continued expansion of OER at City Tech supports several of our important institutional goals. To provide students with a rich set of learning materials available online from any location, to support active learning and more effectively use online instruction, to provide both part and full-time faculty with useful, updated, and ideally collaboratively developed resources, 
and to achieve consistency across sections of a course and coherence between sequential courses. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for coming and giving us your testimony. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by other members of the committee, Council Member Fernando Cabrera and Council Member Vanessa Gibson, so we're glad that they're here. Uh, I was so excited when um, BMCC sent me a letter telling me of what they were doing and brought to my attention the status of where we were with OER and said immediately to my staff, listen, this is going to be our first hearing topic because I'm excited about this. It's something that I think is much needed in terms of helping students who are burdened with these costs of textbook to address that. So I was very excited to hear about that. And I've got lots of questions, and I believe my colleagues will as well, and I'll give them an opportunity to ask those questions. So as we talk about the time that's needed and the training that's needed for faculty faculty to understand how to do that. And I'm glad to know that there is some small stipend for them because I understand that it takes quite a bit of time. But can you talk to me uh, about how much time it takes, first in terms of the training to get faculty to understand what this new platform is, and then the time to actually do the work in converting the materials? Um, so at BMCC, uh, we do have a program where we work with faculty, and the training workshops generally last eight to ten hours. Um, so faculty come together um, to learn about. Can you pull the mic a little sure. closer? We want to make sure we yep, record absolutely. all of this. Absolutely. Uh, so faculty come together in those training workshops to learn about um, all the information they need in terms of Creative Commons licenses for open educational resources. I think you mentioned the licensing or. Um, uh, Chancellor Brinovich might have uh, mentioned that. And there are lots of other things that go into uh, creating this. This is also a pedag pedagogical endeavor. So we work with the faculty um, with what's called uh, in education backward design, where they're thinking about their learning outcome and then figuring out their mm -hmm. assessment and how OER um, fits that. So it's not a simple exercise, and it does take time. And in our mm -hmm. workshop series, it's just to get them started. Um, and it's certainly many, many hours beyond that. Um, that the faculty are working together. Um, what we found is that uh, if we can bring faculty together from a particular department, say we had seven Spanish faculty members come together to create OER specifically for our students um, and their needs, um, that we can create some efficiencies uh, when faculty do collaborate within a department. Um, we also find that these trainings are a great place for developing those communities of practice that were mentioned um, and really creating um, sort of energy and education and knowledge around those resources that's then shared within departments um, with other faculty members. I would say that at City Tech we've worked similarly to the way Jean has described at BMCC. We have a fellowship that requires three or four meetings over the course of a semester and then faculty are developing their OER and then they teach with it the following semester. One of the things that's really exciting to us about the state initiative is that we can not only expand that fellowship but also bring the, the alumni of the fellowship back to really work with diffusing this into their departments. We have had, you know, as Jean mentioned, I think having a number of faculty come together from a similar department is really helpful because then you get that strong cohort in that department. We've so far had sort of one faculty member per department kind of bring it back, and I think we're going to be able to expand it as well. Um, generally, though, we're looking at a similar investment, about eight to ten hours of training, and then availability for folks to come back and talk with us as well, you know, to find information online or to come back and talk to us as they're continuing to develop, um, which, again, we will expand this year with the new funding. So I think you alluded to a question that I had here. Who, besides faculty, is involved in creating these materials? Or is it limited to faculty, or are there other uh, persons who are asked to participate, and what are the qualifications for someone joining in and submitting uh, materials for this OER? Right. Um, at City Tech, it has been faculty creating and curating. So they're either creating their own materials in their own courses, or they're going out to see, you know, as Greg mentioned, um, OpenStax, uh, the University of Minnesota. Um, there are some materials that are out there, so going out and bringing materials together. We have really benefited at City Tech in a way that is not always the case at the other schools in that we have this Open Lab, which is a platform that we use to host. It's a digital platform. And we do have some technical support 
for the open lab. So the technical end of the support tends to come from our open lab staff, and then it's library faculty who have been working with um, faculty in the departments to curate and evaluate and find uh, the OERs. It's been a really nice partnership. I think the library faculty um, have a good knowledge of the scholarly communications landscape, but we don't have the deep disciplinary knowledge that the faculty in the departments do. So the pairing is, is an apt one, I think. So as a faculty member is going to gather the materials, they're able to go to whomever they think would be a resource to help them to develop the material and to present it in its final form. Absolutely, and I think there are a couple of um, key constituents on campus to help with that. So um, certainly a technical support on uh, one side in terms of yeah. faculty actually curating and bringing together and delivering those um, resources. Also, um, in our case, we partner with the Center for Excellence in Teaching, Learning, and Scholarship. So this is really um, a faculty development initiative. The library has lots of expertise um, as faculty ourselves. Um, that we bring to that, but a partnership with um, the Center for Excellence in Teaching, Learning, and Scholarship is um, natural in this case because they also do a lot of faculty development work, so it's a really good synergistic relationship. And um, some of our colleges do have instructional designers, and they will also be involved. We're not one of those, um, but it does help uh, when everybody who works on instru instructional design, as we said, this is a pedagogical um, exercise, so anybody who's involved in that instructional design can be helpful as well. So often it's technical instructional design as well as our Centers for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. Okay, so in a perfect world, I guess, you know, faculty, instructors, and professors would say, oh, this is great. But what kind of resistance or pushback or hesitancy do you encounter from perhaps that professor who's written a great textbook, which is the source and acknowledged as the go-to document, who's now being presented with this new design for instruction? Um, to answer your specific question, we have encountered that. Um, and in some cases, that faculty member is amenable to um, making that textbook to either letting the copyright with the publisher of that textbook expire or to, in some cases, if it's a self-published textbook, um, to making that available at no cost um, or to authoring their own cost material, uh, their own course materials. Um, but that is, that is an open question. You know, we do have faculty who are textbook authors. And um, I do think that the, we have seen that the students do not have the book argument as a persuasive argument. And it is, it, it is, um, it is a situation that faculty are encountering every day in their classes, students who don't have the book. So the, the, um, that, that, is, that is something that we can point to that can help us make those changes. But it is an open, it is an ongoing conversation. Again, having some funds to pay a modest stipend or to, you know, not only to help develop, but also to um, give some support, financial support for them to develop materials is very helpful, for sure. So what's your goal in terms of participation of faculty across CUNY? What's your goal? And a timeline so, that right, matches. Right, right. No, no, no. You, you raise a great question. And, um, well, to be frank, our goal is to convert as many courses and programs to OER as possible so that students can go through CUNY if they need to and wish to without ever having to invest in a textbook. I think that is a worthy goal because we always want to reimagine access in our time. And that is an opportunity that has presented itself in our time. Um, we will need to fix um, and, and reimagine many things for that to happen. I appreciate um, Maura's uh, comments about faculty resistance and your question. Whereas our faculty have been incredibly enthusiastic and really remarkably collegial um, and um, excited about this initiative, even though it's more work for them. It's, it's a lots lot more of time work. in both development and in, yes. quite frankly, in delivery. And one of the things that that 
that I would like to address as this expands rapidly, and it appears that it will, because as um, I believe Greg said, um, now that our students can find on the global search tool all of the OER courses that we offer, we expect students to seek these courses out in increasing numbers and, and take them, which will put pressure on faculty and courses that are not that are that that, that are, are you know that are that are not um, free of charge or nearly free of charge. One of the things we will need to address is not simply incentivizing the faculty to develop the courses, but quite frankly, to recognizing and honoring this work. In other words. Mm -hmm. What is the role of OER development, maintenance, improvement in tenure promotion and other forms mm. of faculty recognition? And again, Chair Barron, I would lie to you if I said we've had that conversation in a serious, comprehensive way. But it's but good that it's being considered. Yeah, that's right. But I know it's coming. Just mm -hmm. like online learning generally, which of course is, is somewhat different from this, and OER is often a part of fully online program development. If you're asking for quality and you're asking for outcomes, the question arises, what, what are the incentives for faculty mm -hmm. to do this? Okay. Uh, when you talked about the, um, the OER initiative and that it was awarded to campuses based on their proposals, how many campuses submitted proposals I heard you, I read that all of them received something, but how many campuses submitted proposals? Every campus. Submitted. And what was the range of the awards, um, the dollar amounts? The range is from $30,000 to $260,000. And the schools that all of the campuses responded, do they have the capacity for the uh, support that's needed to have all of the students now? Um, some do and some don't. So for example, BMCC and City Tech, they have um, internal infrastructure, um, internal IT support, um, instructional design support. And, and so <coughs> hence their proposals were, were big. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we felt like they were attainable. Um, based on our knowledge, you know, the libraries really kind of, we converse with, with all the colleges. Um, we're, we're more or less a hub um, mm -hmm. that coordinates training, support, and advice about technology um, options for colleges that are just getting their feet wet in OER. Um, so we do a lot of hand-holding in that respect. Um, so that it's really a partnership between um, the Office of Library Services, and sometimes we pull in Gene, for example, or other sort of OER champions um, who are well-versed um, to help the schools sort of just, you know, as I said before, get their feet wet, start a program. And, you know, our sort of, <laughs> our experience with, with dealing of colleges of varying sort of um, capacity levels, um, you know, makes us an ideal partner. And my last question before I pass it to my colleagues. This is a grand opportunity, I think, to um, address the flaws of textbooks, which are limited, which uh, lock many cultural contributions from lots of different groups out of what's written in the textbook. Is there an emphasis or is there some um, push to make sure that now that we have this opportunity that we're much more inclusive of the contributions of African Americans, of Latinos in constructing these materials? Chair Barron, the, the and other groups, of course. I'm, not, I'm just using those two as examples. No, no, no. It, it's a great question. It's a great question for CUNY in this moment in OER development. Only time will tell, and one of the things we want to do is monitor the OER experience. What do these courses look like? How are they different? But knowing CUNY faculty and knowing that this new opportunity to curate, to build courses um, uh, will inspire them, I can only imagine that the courses are already more inclusive, more up-to-date, have more of a global perspective, reflect our student body and our diverse faculty. But I, I want to 
to also um, um, confer with the professors about <coughs> Chair Barron's issue of diversity, inclusiveness, and how our materials might look different from standard texts. Sure, I can give you the case of BMCC. So um, there's actually a national conversation that's just starting on this topic, and two mm. of our faculty have been invited to participate on a panel in Anaheim, uh, California at the Open Ed Conference um, in October. And so this is a panel about equity and the lack of culturally responsive material in OER. And so it's a, a really terrific question and something that is just getting on the table for us. And it's really important to remember that OER are definitely context-specific, contextual, um, and so to acknowledge that within the United States, but also within the Global North, Global South dynamic. Um, this is a worldwide movement, a national movement, and so we want to be a part of that conversation, and we want to be um, mm -hmm. leading the way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, in terms of context, to give an example of our criminal justice program with its Z degree, um, they are very progressive um, and actually have a critical pedagogical focus um, specifically in this area. And so we designed courses that are OER courses, and we found out that actually they're not transferring to other colleges that are more traditional mm. and aren't looking at criminal justice the way we are. Um, and so this has oh. been significant, um, but it's also an opportunity that there may be people who are not aware of that critical lens on criminal justice who see these courses, which are now open to anybody in the country, um, that that may change perspectives and actually allow us again to lead in terms of bringing together those materials mm -hmm. in that way. So I said that was my last question, but I have that generated another question. So if the materials are content specific and if it addresses the curriculum, why would it not be accepted uh, as a transfer to another school, what's the op what's the there? There hindrance? are local differences. Uh, for example, um, with our criminal justice program, we offer some courses that aren't offered in other criminal justice programs in community colleges across the country. So it's not that it's OER, we are, but that no, it's, no, no, okay. yeah, no. It's specific okay. to um, the population and to okay. uh, the focus of the faculty involved. Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go first to Councilmember Cabrera, and he'll be followed by Councilmember Gibson. Thank questions. you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and welcome. Uh, I'm just curious with, uh, with the administration, uh, with CUNY and also, I'm sorry, the CUNY and uh, would the professors be amicable to the idea that in the contract with the professors, there will be a certain amount, there will be a percentage uh, every year where more and more courses will be guaranteed to be an OER. <laughs> the truth is, Councilmember Cabrera, you are right that um, online offerings have posed challenges um, regarding faculty workload that must be, you know, that, that, are, that are always part of our negotiations and our conversations with um, the Professional Staff Congress, and, and it's, a, it's an important issue. Um, CUNY has a challenging faculty workload, as you know, and um, and we are we're asking more of our faculty. Again, there's no question about that. And the fact that they love it, that they throw themselves into it, is a tribute to the kind of faculty who are attracted to a career at CUNY. Obviously, faculty are not being in any way pressured. Um, to teach the kinds of courses that they're not inclined to teach. And at CUNY, faculty have tremendous um, influence over their curricula and pedagogy. A lot of faculty are attracted to this because of the kind of people they are, and they, they want to do better for their students. They want to deliver more. They, they see this as an opportunity, and the affordability issue is always uppermost in our minds. Um, it has to be. So um, what I, I have, the question has come to me with regard to online courses and online programs. Frankly, not in the context of OER specifically, because OER um, can be an important part of an otherwise traditionally taught class. I want to ask my fellow librarians who know better, on, I've never taught an OER uh, class, I haven't been in the classroom in too many years, in terms of additional workload and how faculty feel about, um, and, and how faculty reflect about that, 
could you add anything to answer that would address the council member's question? I can, I can start. Um, I, I do think that there, there can be additional workload, but we, all, we always like to start with the baseline of any time you bring in a new textbook, you are going to need to make some changes to your course. Um, so that is a workflow and a process that faculty are familiar with, especially, again, faculty in fast-changing disciplines who are going to have to adopt to a, a different course, um, a different textbook. We also, at City Tech, we have a number of unusual programs. So for example, we have the degree program in entertainment technology, which is variously about stage technology and lighting design, as well as about emerging media, um, robotics, and other internet-based technologies. Um, many of those materials, actually, many of those courses have been OER courses for a long time because right. there simply are no textbooks that address the um, content of that course. So some faculty are already kind of predisposed to, to do that. And some faculty are doing that work to supplement as well. You know, it's, um, it's a little bit off the record, but you do hear faculty who I've heard from students that a faculty member, that they came to class with the book because they, it was in the syllabus, but then the book was never used. And that faculty member is preparing other materials that the students right. have access to. So, you know, I think appealing to some of the work that faculty are doing anyway um, will help us get there, at least help us, help us have a positive starting point to the additional work conversation. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You have the eager professors who are eager to do this work. Mm -hmm. You're going to hit a wall very mm -hmm. soon mm -hmm. because you would uh, essentially uh, run out of professors who are eager to do it because they're so be benevolent about their work. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then we're going to end up uh, in a situation where more, most courses will not be uh, offering OER, and they'll, they'll be continuing to pay this exuberant work with many <laughs> courses. You're so right. I, I, I was a professor, and, uh, and I could tell you, and I was a program director, I could tell you numerous professors who required this expensive book and never used in class and never cared for it because they were told by the department, use this book. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think at one point, if r professors are really serious about their students, uh, they have to be serious about the accessibility of this textbook. And the only way I foresee that we could do that if it is done through the contracts. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Councilmember Gibson. Thank you very much, Chair Barron, and good morning to all of you at CUNY. Thank you so much for your testimony, your presence, and certainly all of the efforts that you're making. As a CUNY grad myself, um, I certainly appreciate all the efforts that CUNY has undertaken to really look at affordability of textbooks and making sure that we provide um, as much access and opportunity for so many students. I wish OER was around when I was at school, um, but for unfortunately, um, it wasn't, but I was one of those students that I really tried to expand on my hustle game. So I was able to rent books online and really use the library as much as I could um, because at the end of the day, you do have a lot of students that do have to make that difficult choice. Do I spend, you know, $100, $200 on this textbook or do I use it for something else? And obviously all of the different amenities are very important, food, transportation, et cetera, but I do understand the plight of so many CUNY students. So I also am excited, as our chair has indicated, and I wanted to find out um, the level of relationship and consistency that the department that CUNY has with all of the professors around the entire system um, in terms of keeping pace with the textbook requirements. So one of the challenges I realized at Baruch um, when I was taking uh, classes for my master's was every semester there seemed to be a new addition. Uh, there would be one chapter that would change, and then the requirement was to have edition 1A or 1B. And it was really frustrating because the initial book I had was simply good enough, but yet it wasn't good enough for the professor. So I wanted to understand the relationship that CUNY has with all of the faculty in terms of keeping pace with all of the requirements to make sure that obviously professors are very sensitive to the course and making sure that, you know, do we necessarily have to have an amendment to this particular book? Do we have to have a chapter 1A? So could you give us a better sense of what CUNY is doing to make sure that you keep pace with some of the requirements that our professors are placing? Okay, Councilmember Gibson, I'll start. And 
tell you CUNY does not have a policy, uh, a university-wide policy on textbook adoption um, that would give guidance to faculty regarding how often they might change um, a textbook every time there was a new edition. I certainly know from my own experience as being a professor, a teaching professor for more than 20 years, that some faculty always adopted the new edition and other faculty waited longer to do that. What I can tell you is more and more departments um, do provide I don't know if the word is guidance or pressure to use particular textbooks. That is, the intro, you know, site text at so, such and such a college might be one or at most two uh, textbooks so that there aren't 14 different intro to site textbooks being offered at a place like Hunter College, a large college. So, so th but, but those are policies that are mostly not only not at CUNY level, but they're not even at the college level, they're at the department level. But the issue that you raised is an important one. Um, it's tremendously burdensome for students to have to buy new textbooks because a few charts or graphs are no longer current or a chapter is, you know, uh, there's a new chapter that, that might be added or subtracted as fields change. And that's where OER offers a tremendous benefit for fast changing disciplines. But um, again, CUNY has no policy. Um, it's really college and discipline specific. Does anyone else have something to say about textbook policies at colleges for to, to answer the council member's question? I think you covered it. Okay, yeah, it's no CUNY policy on it. Okay, well, do you think that's something that will be discussed further on down the line? I guess my concern is I want to make sure that there is a, a level of consistency and there are some level of guidelines that come yes, from right. CUNY to give direction to the various colleges across the system. Um, I would love to see, you know, at least to have a conversation to find out if that's something that could even be viable. Yes. Actually, I can, I can comment on this uh, just, just a little bit. Um, the whole OER conversation, you know, OER, the advent of OER, um, sure, yes. sure, the advent of OER really has been, it, it started with a grassroots movement. And, mm -hmm. and as I said, uh, it culminated, uh, but throughout the past few years, you know, awareness of it has, has slowly and surely taken hold. And with any type of movement like this, and you could go to any system, um, and even systems that provide um, sort of robust infrastructure, um, getting the faculty to buy in, especially when you have different cultures at the department levels and at a system yes. level, it, <coughs> there's, there's just, there's many layers to the onion. Um, but one thing that we do at the central office is, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of faculty um, aren't really aware of, you know, the cost of their decisions um, to, to require a new textbook, uh, require a new $200 textbook. And at, the, at least in my, it, in my day at CUNY, I have not really heard this conversation happening at the highest levels. And that's mm -hmm. something that I, th I think that we can bring to the Provost Council, we can bring to the, the Discipline Councils um, to raise awareness. Okay. I just want to add, because it's a, it's a great question you raise. Um, Many times we can despair of changing behavior, and this gets to Council Members Cabrera's comments as well, but faculty and students both respond to information about um, how, how, as Greg suggested, how their decisions are affecting our students and how others are acting who are successful and who are effective. For example, if I may, uh, an example from remediation. Um, many of our students, if left on their own, will not take a retest for which they are qualified, for which they are eligible. Um, but if they're told something like 42% of students who take the test again pass it on the second try. 
they will be much more likely to show up to take the test if they get some kind of information, real data, that, um, that, that give them a sense that people like them can do this. And faculty can also respond to information about how we deal with the exorbitant costs of textbooks. So, mm -hmm. Councilwoman, you've given me an idea about how we could move the needle. Okay, great. I love ideas. Um, I just have one more question I wanted to ask, and I um, see that CUNY has been a recipient of several different grants, the Gates Grant in 2016. Both Councilmember Cabrera and I represent Bronx County, obviously BCC, Lehman, and Holstow, so we hear a lot from many students who are our constituents. So I wanted to ask about the long-term um, funding streams in terms of grant opportunities that you are receiving. Are those grants over several years? Um, and, you know, do we anticipate furthering, you know, those grant opportunities? I want to make sure, obviously, OER is successful, so we want to continue to make sure that these grantors are investing and will continue to invest in successful measures for students. Because they all have deadlines, I assume, They all right? have deadlines, and I'm going okay. to say, just repeat what Greg said and then pass it over to him. The $4 million investment by the state, the, our largest investment, uh -huh. is a one-year investment. So we're, you know, working as hard as we can to show as much, not just activity, but results as we can. But, okay. But I will pass this on to you. Okay, that means you'll be going to Albany in January, right? <laughs> you'll be okay, lovely great. in January. Okay, yes. It's cold, but $4 million, you can travel to Albany. <laughs> <laughs> so we're hoping to speak softly and carry a big stick. Yeah. So okay. and <laughs> to maximize a return on their investment, um, right. you know, I think they really laid the gauntlet down for us. They gave us $4 million uh -huh. and like a month to, to develop and execute a strategy. And that strategy, um, the result of that strategy was our, um, you know, our internal RFPs, which were really sort of driven by um, uh, participation, um, because we really need to deliver maximum results. Um, so that's that's kind of our mindset. Um, is, you know, we don't want to be one and done with the state. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that um, that we this the state has already seen progress. They've seen. Um, the sort of structure of our strategy, and so far so good. Um, they asked they asked us for another proposal for a four-year proposal as well. Um, so, you know, we're just going to keep our nose to the grindstone and keep working on executing our strategy. Um, the Gates grant was actually um, a two-year grant. Okay, two years. And <coughs> the ATD grant is two and a half years, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Achieving the dream, excuse me. Okay. So, you know, I mean, the Achieving the Dream beget the Gates grant. Actually, there was a partner in both. Um, that was Lumen Learning, a technology vendor, who was kind of uh, the glue. Um, and so we're networking with the Hewitts of the world, the Gates of the world, and, and some of the technology partners. And, of course, we do the same with SUNY, too. So, you know, we brainstorm with SUNY all the time about um, – joining forces, and that Gates grant was actually the first CUNY SUNY grant of its type that I believe. Okay. Um, so we want to leverage that. Okay. I agree and can capitalize on everything that you have available. I happen to be a graduate of SUNY also. So any way that, you know, certainly we can be helpful, we want to make sure that we are um, having the right conversation so that you can continue to receive those grant opportunities. For all the students from our respective districts, we really appreciate it. So I encourage you to keep up the good work, and thank you very much, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. My colleagues have generated some other questions, which I want to bring forth at this time. So according to the Higher Education Opportunity Act, textbook provisions, uh, publishers are required to disclose the prices and revision information when they're marketing their textbooks to professors. professors. So how does that notification process work? How can students access that information? How can we make sure that professors are sensitive to that information when they are um, assigning their textbooks for their classes? Right, right. So. Chair Barron, in reviewing the 2014 testimony, the last time you you had a um, a panel on this, and which was which was itself galvanizing, I uh, I saw that CUNY's compliance with the Higher Education Opportunity Act was let's just say not impressive at that time. Um, 
but since that time, um, we have been much more responsive um, to the need for students to know what a textbook costs um, than we were three years ago. The numbers are still not where we want to be, and I'm very pleased to have Wendy Layden uh, from um, Computer Information Systems here to help me, but I do want to be more responsive. So what percentage of our professors uh, and of our textbook uh, costs are now available to students? Here's where that virtual bookstore, ac um, Academos, may has made a difference. When, when you held the hearing in uh, 2014, one college, John Jay, had uh, uh, expressed interest in, in um, contracting with a virtual bookstore to bring down textbook costs mm -hmm. and, and all of it. And I, I, um, according to my notes and Wendy, I may uh, call you up for some help. What happened there is, um, Three other CUNY colleges subsequently piggybacked on John Jay's contract, Queens, Medgar Evers, and the law school. And so four CUNY students, uh, CUNY colleges went all in on uh, the virtual bookstore. Um, it is our plan that every CUNY college will be a part of the virtual bookstore because it saves students money and it also helps our compliance with the act. Um, in addition to the original four, four colleges, eight new colleges began using the CUNY Virtual Bookstore this year. And um, Brooklyn City, Gutman, all across the uh, Hunter, uh, the School of Medicine, York, and two more colleges will go live next year. You may ask, why aren't they all in the Virtual Bookstore? Uh, many of our colleges have contracts with bookstores that would be expensive to get out of. So as soon as their contracts with their, um, uh, with their uh, vendor uh, expires, they become a part of Academos. And for colleges that are in Academos, and there are 12 of them, the compliance rate with the Higher Ed uh, Opportunity um, uh, Act is between 77 and 86 percent. That's a big, when we last came before you, we were way under 50 percent. But the colleges that are non-academo schools, and there are several of them, only have a 44 percent compliance rate at this time. So much better again than we were three years ago, but we're not there yet. Um, I can't explain why the compliance rate is so low except that this is an individual matter and when the bookstore is not supporting the effort consistently we get lower compliance rates. I'm going to turn to my fellow librarians and, and Wendy, do you have anything to add to the statement about, again, CUNY compliance is improving all the time. I also understand that these numbers may improve um, because 18% of colleges that are not in compliance have some material up. So this is, you know, th this is not our best foot forward. Um, is there anything that uh, you might add, please? Okay, you need to come forward and be yes. uh, sworn in, and yes. then you can uh, gladly give your testimony. Yes, I don't have a lot to add. Okay, <laughs> but, but please. Um, please raise your right hand. Right here. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. So just to add to that. Um, your name, uh, please, for the Wendy record. Wendy Later, L-A-D-E-R. Um, this is going by Academos, who runs the uh, virtual bookstore platform for the colleges that are participating. They've been providing us data on the Higher Education Opportunities Act compliance, and they've found that 86% on average of the colleges uh, have complied. 86% of the courses of per at the participating colleges have submitted the data that's required by the Act. Uh, which is substantially higher than the other colleges that are not yet on the platform. So 86% of on the average. colleges, and that's 12 campuses? 12 campuses, right. 
So what's required? It, what what are the um, what's the process that we don't have all of our schools complying? I mean, what are the obstacles? Do they need more training? Do they know that they have to do it? Why isn't it? I'm glad to know that it's more than it was. No, no. We, it, but it, it, why don't we have a, a greater number than 12? And, That's less than half of our schools. It is, it is, Chair Barron. And again, two more schools are coming online next next year, and the others will follow. I'm going to, Greg, do you have any sense of what the barriers are to higher compliance, despite our efforts, our reminders? Of Maybe I have an analogy. Um, okay. And, and that is CUNY First is a, is a, is a new central platform um, <clears throat> that manages most of the business processes at CUNY. Um, CUNY First um, has been a project that replaced, um, I believe there was 11 different flavors of, of that type of back-end system. So there was kind of a rolling long-term implementation of CUNY First. So mm -hmm. certain aspects of of CUNY First that may have been compliance related were probably introduced, but they weren't sort of followed through um, in, in as timely a fashion as possible. I, I'm only speculating, but I, I just know that when you're talking about um, a system-wide migration of, of not only systems, but uh, the wraparound um, policies, et cetera, behind that, um, it may not be the smoothest um, transition. Um, okay, so let me go to another question. Then. When do we expect that we'll have 100%? I'll ask that question. <laughs> okay, actually. Well, Chair Barron, now that we're on this and, and textbook costs are um, going to be a focus, 100% is tough when faculty are involved. Uh, it, w that is when it's, it's not simply a matter of officers of the university. Okay, when will we have 99%? Okay, all right. Okay, <laughs> okay I'm more comfortable answering that. Okay. I would, um, Wendy, when will, do we know when all of the, CUNY First is now fully implemented and that, that will help. There's no question about that. Right, th and thank you, Greg, for mentioning it. When will the last college come online, uh, uh, come into the Academos virtual, uh, uh, virtual bookstore umbrella? We don't have a schedule for that. It is open. It's a CUNY-wide uh, platform, so it's open to any college whose bookstore contract expires or is terminated. Right. Uh, we do so then perhaps the question is, do we know when, when those contracts... Right, that's right. the question. Okay. That's yes. the question, right. Chair Barron, and we can get we can that get for that you. Right, okay. absolutely. And, 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 and are, are there one. any other colleges that no longer have that brick and mortar? I think there was just one uh, previously, John Jay. Right. So now do we uh, Right, so have John Jay others? has no more a, right. a bookstore. Um, I don't know right. that other colleges have closed their bookstores. I believe but a I've lot of them have. Okay, if we could find we out. And, we could and find out. That That's right. Please. That's right. Okay. And That's so right. those bookstores have contracts. Yes. And you said it would be expensive to try to get out of those right. contracts. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. But it seems that they are, they are um, uh, we have not heard any feedback that um, a college does not want to come under the virtual bookstore umbrella. Okay. Okay. okay good. Um, I have a few other questions before we call our next panel. Oh, here's the question. How are students notified about the health concerns and best practices regarding, the, uh, regarding exposure to too much blue light? There's a health concern. The, the health yeah. community says that there are some concerns right. with extended exposure yeah. to the blue light of the screens. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we don't have the answer now, we can I do try to make sure that we consider right. that right. and make students aware mm -hmm. that they need to gauge the time that That's they're spending on that. Mm -hmm. um, Your testimony said that at present, CUNY colleges with undergraduate programs are participating. Do we envision moving this to the graduate level? And what's the timetable for that? Absolutely. Um, well, so the $4 million was earmarked only for the undergraduate positions. Oh, okay. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, um, the OER movement was really born out of the community college 
community colleges. Yes. Um, right. However, um, the, the graduate level offers a variety, I think, of very compelling options. One, um, one is involved with digital humanities. Um, and the Grad Center is actually a, a national leader in digital humanities, which are really digital learning objects um, that can be used um, as l learning objects. Um, I, <laughs> I wish I had an example off the top of my head, but uh, I can certainly provide those later. Um, you know, I, another thing that um, we've been talking about with um, the Graduate Center is to help train a cadre of their grad students in the principles of OER and get and get them on board, so to speak, or get them exposed. So, um, you know, it, it is a tremendous factory of, of teachers that come out of CUNY. And um, so, so to include that, um, you know, in their curriculum is something that we're, we're, we're talking to the grad center right now about doing. And finally, before I call the next panel, uh, can you describe how students are tracked or will be tracked via their usage of OER. So our students tracked uh, for a number of reasons. We want to get the data collection, of course. And then are there any privacy concerns about the software that students are reading? You know, Big Brother kind of concept looking at them. So, And um, will we be able to collect that data as we expand the use of OER? I can uh, give the central perspective, and, and that is, um, you know, with this attribute, um, in CUNY first, the course attribute, um, we can begin to start gathering data. And since that attribute was really just implemented um, a few months ago, um, this will go into the standard set of, of data analysis and collection um, and privacy protections um, that, uh, <clears throat> that the Office of Institutional Research um, is guided by. So this, this data will flow basically um, into their systems and their processes. So this is something that we will have to um, get back to you on. Okay, and finally, in terms of textbook costs, which are the majors that are the most expensive? I would think I know, but what are the majors that are most expensive in terms of textbook costs? Is that a question? Um, anything STEM? Anything STEM. Any STEM. Um, especially the, uh, for us at City Tech, the health, the health sciences, so nursing, very expensive. Um, business, also very expensive. Yep, I would agree. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Great. Thank you Humanities so much. Are Humanities are cheaper. <laughs> Humanities are cheaper, right. Okay, thank you so much. I do appreciate your testimony. And if you could respond to those respond questions to that those we asked. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next panelist is going to be Richard Hirschman from the National Association of That's College awesome. Stores. alone this time. <laughs> oh, that's, that's okay. You can carry it. We're going to ask our counsel to swear right. you in. Raise your right hand, please. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Barron and members of the Committee on Higher Education, on behalf of the National Association of College Stores, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on how college textbooks can be made more affordable for college students. Uh, my name is Rich Hirschman. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations for the National Association of College Stores. We originally were founded here in New York City in 1923 and now are in uh, the quiet town of Oberlin, Ohio uh, as our headquarters. Um, this is the third time I've been before this committee, uh, 2014 and then in also in 2010. Uh, and uh, I've been to a lot of hearings on this issue over the last 12, 13 years of my career. Uh, in this space, and, and I always find this, this committee is really engaged in the topic, so I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm really anxious to uh, get into some of the questions and answers for you. Uh, when I last testified uh, in 2014, the transformation in college textbook affordability efforts were really getting underway at reducing costs, creating greater transparency, 
and uh, more choices in the marketplace. Uh, and you've heard about some of those choices like open educational resources. And I'm pleased to report the progress continues and the results are pretty clear and positive. Um, however, there's work that remains, particularly in enhancing the value and use of course materials and addressing some of the underlying financial pressures on students, which as you know are not limited to tuition fees and course materials. I think I've, one of the things I've really remarked, noted uh, in all the hearings I've seen this year and discussions around textbook affordability, I hear more about gas, food, and transportation uh, today than I've ever heard uh, in, in previous uh, hearings and discussions around the textbook affordability issue because there's larger issues in play. Um, the good news is that the average student uh, nationally spent about $579 in the 2016-2017 school year, which is 17% lower than it was in 2007-2008 when students on average spent $701. Uh, our association has a research arm. We survey uh, a large number of students, uh, I think the samples around 20,000 students, every year, twice a year on their uh, course material um, spending, behavior, uh, issues and how they interact with course materials. And so this data we've been tracking now for, for quite some time. Uh, the positive trend, despite all the fact that students are still requiring about the same amount of material, so even as spending has declined, generally students are still acquiring the same number of units as they were in the past. Um, quality and features of course materials are improving, uh, both in OER and in commercial materials. And, uh, you know, other costs of attendance are continuing to climb. So federal data, which also show, starting to show this, is showing cost of attendance is increasing, but this one area at least is either getting stagnant, uh, not increasing, not actually decreasing, or slightly decreasing, depending on the sector. Um, it's important to understand these are averages. So, I mean, if any students in the room, they might say, well, I spent over $1,000 or $1,200 or $1,500. So it can vary significantly between community college students and four-year institution students from uh, freshman students who tend to uh, take a lot of introductory courses uh, to upper-level courses which tend to not rely as, as heavily on expensive course materials. Uh, so it, it varies and it's important to recognize that. And, and the last question about uh, majors, uh, we have some data in, our, in uh, the attachment on my testimony which shows uh, what students are saying they're spending based on major. Uh, some STEM uh, areas, math, uh, computer sciences, are the lowest levels of spending. Uh, other, others are high, and I think the uh, witnesses correctly indicated uh, business and uh, uh, medical areas, particularly nursing, have a higher cost, higher spending. Um, I know there's the Excelsior Scholarship Program, and, and it's been limited to tuition, and I know that's been subjected to a lot of uh, criticism among uh, higher education policy experts that, that I interact with in Washington. Uh, one thing I, I would note as a positive in that with respect to course materials is for those students in Excelsior, it provides an opportunity to fully utilize the American Opportunity Tax Credit, the federal tax credit for course materials. Uh, so th the tax credit will no longer have to be consumed by tuition and fees, but could be applied more directly towards uh, course materials. Tax credits aren't a perfect way of doing financial aid, uh, but there are ways to get that money into the hands of students, uh, front-loading by, if they're working, uh, by reducing their uh, withholdings on their paychecks. Um, Schools, I think, need to do a better job, though, in informing students about uh, available financial aid, including the tax credits, uh, and how to uh, claim them. Because a lot of students are not uh, taking advantage of tax, uh, tax credits like they should. Uh, some discussion about uh, the cost of books, supplies, and equipment as part of the overall cost of attendance. Um, a lot of those comparisons earlier in testimony re referenced uh, in relation to tuition and fees. But when we look at the total cost of attendance, according to the College Board, uh, books, supplies, and equipment covers about 2.5% of the cost of attendance at public four-year institutions and 8.2% of the cost at uh, community colleges. So there's, um, it is a significant cost, but it, there are other cost pressures involved as well. 
Uh, campus bookstores today provide students a choice between new, used, rental, digital options, and information on how to obtain materials uh, at no additional cost, such as OER materials or library resources. Uh, many of CUNY institutions also continue to offer physical store locations to better assist students and faculty with their variety of needs and preferences. So not every institution, uh, obviously some have contract obligations, but not everyone has completely gone over to the virtual stores. And I would also point out that Hunter College, uh, which uh, did sign up with uh, partnering with Academos, also uh, 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 partnered with an off-campus independent bookseller across the street as their official uh, brick and mortar store. So the st institutions really need to weigh what's the appropriate model uh, and how to best serve their student body, which may differ at different institutions. And virtual stores may be the right answer for some, and other answers it may be both click and brick. Um, online marketplaces uh, allow students to shop online at the campus store from a variety of other online providers and uh, simultaneously, and one of the pr uh, significant progress that's been made here at CUNY uh, since our last test hearing uh, was that the 13 or 12 institutions that have gone to Academos offer that online marketplace solution uh, like NYU uh, was doing at that time. So students can shop on Amazon, eBay, uh, and several other providers off of Academos's platform. Um, all the institution bookstores, all the institutions in the system now offer price match guarantees uh, with online competitors. So that's another way of ensuring uh, students are getting a good value and uh, the institutions are providing uh, the best possible price. Um, faculty have more options in the marketplace to choose from, uh, from both more affordable commercial materials as well as open educational resources. Uh, however, in our most recent faculty survey, 55% of faculty report being unsure about the role they play in textbook affordability, and more than 40% of faculty do not view textbook affordability as a priority for their institution or themselves. So certainly we were concerned with that data. I think things have improved with faculty, uh, and I would probably say if we looked at data specifically to the CUNY system, I think faculty would be far more sensitive to this issue uh, than, than our larger uh, sample. Um, and public institutions tend to be a lot more sensitive as well as community colleges in particular. Um, a new generation of course material discovery, selection, and price saving tools are being deployed across the CUNY system. You heard a little bit about that. Uh, I think the record needs to be addressed a little bit about uh, the, ch the adoption cycle. Uh, CUNY the problem that CUNY had in 2014 uh, is a common among a lot of institutions where you, you need leadership of the president, the provost, to really enforce faculty submitting their adoptions in on time. Uh, and that is a challenge at a lot of institutions. CUNY certainly has a lot of very independent-minded faculty, which I think probably presents some unique challenges. Uh, but what was the part of the problem was CUNY created a self design in-house solution to faculty submitting adoptions, which was cumbersome and not very helpful to faculty. Uh, and uh, so we ended up with these two different systems. Some institutions were using the bookstore system. Some were submitting in this uh, very bare bones system at CUNY First. And what we have now uh, that was part of the RFP uh, and the contract that was awarded for the virtual stores was a requirement to use a more state-of-the-art textbook adoption platform that allows faculty to discover materials, including o OER materials, and adopt them and do it in a, in a way that's uh, much more quick and easy for the faculty. So you take away some of the pain. And the institutional stores that are still have brick and mortar, they have those platforms too. And there should be an increase. And I did check with Academos and they said that their adoption rates have increased. And some of that has to do with uh, the way that CUNY has integrated CUNY First with a single login back over to their platform. Uh, so the bookstore is now managing this process more fully instead of uh, central IT department. And uh, we're getting more reliable data, which was the biggest concern I had four years ago, which was making sure that the information was accurate for the students. Because it's one thing to submit it, but if a professor just puts it in, wrong ISBN number or something else, posts it online without anyone verifying it, 
uh, that can create problems for students if they go shopping and or end up with the wrong book. So that's, I think, uh, very important, and, and I think CUNY should be complimented for uh, making progress in that space. But a continued leadership has to happen at the president, provost, uh, and reminders uh, frequently. Uh, bookstores do everything and anything to get faculty to turn in their adoptions. Some do pizza parties. Some award book scholarships, uh, courtesy of the department. Uh, they will do anything to get adoptions in uh, because it means lower cost for students and allows the stores to source uh, materials at the lowest possible cost. Um, increasingly, uh, these platforms are incorporating OER materials. And uh, Barnes and Noble, which runs several of the, about seven of the CUNY's institutions, has implemented a program called Faculty in Light, uh, which allows uh, school faculty and administrators the ability to discover open educational resources. So they can do some of the same things that are being discussed uh, in sourcing from different uh, repositories. So they're pulling information from repositories like the Merlot repository and some of the other OER repositories across the country and presenting it to, to faculty. And what's powerful about it is uh, in these sy new systems is that they're presenting OER alongside commercial materials. Uh, so a professor can take a look and see who's using the material in different states or different colleges and universities and compare uh, between this commercial textbook that's being offered and an OpenStax textbook that's being offered. Uh, some of these programs, I don't know if Academos does it, but I, I know um, a platform called Sidewalk uh, to address uh, the councilwoman's uh, question. If a professor adopts a new textbook, a new edition, they have a warning. <laughs> if, if the price goes up on the adoption after they've submitted all the information, they, they, a warning goes on the screen, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, this is more expensive. If you stay to the sec older edition, this is what students will pay. Uh, and some have also implemented affordability scales so faculty can see how does this textbook or this option compare to other options in the marketplace. So these tools, if they're fully utilized, uh, can really create um, valuable information and put it into the hands of faculty uh, so they make the most informed decisions and weigh cost as part of their considerations which, you know, still I, I believe personally that quality should still remain uh, the key uh, determination, but, but cost needs to be part of that discussion. Uh, we're partnering with a, a number of folks. Uh, Academos, which is uh, now at uh, several institutions, is uh, partnering with uh, an ebook distributor called Redshelf. Redshelf just announced a major change in and partnership with OpenStax which is going to provide their, e, uh, their open textbooks, which are generally in a PDF or EPUB format, in an enhanced platform, ebook platform. So it's going to have the notate, notations uh, and other kinds of uh, things to make the digital textbook a little more useful and readable uh, and a better experience uh, for students because generally students don't like just PDF ebooks. Uh, it's not a, a value add to what they've been using in uh, print materials. So you really have to create uh, digital materials in a way that enhance uh, the students' uh, learning. Uh, we also partner with OpenStax to distribute print copies in, in hard copy format. Uh, and we've uh, worked with them to bring the cost down of those hard copies. And institutions are also able to produce print copies on their own as well. And, uh, and I know there's a lot of interest in, in developing and printing, uh, making low-cost print options available for students who prefer that format. Um, finally, I, I, I should say, I don't speak for the publishers, but I think the publishers are starting to make uh, some significant efforts to try to lower prices and increase value and effectiveness of their products. Um, for once, uh, one of the things that I track is the consumer price index you mentioned in your opening remarks, as well as the producer price index. Producer price index goes back to the 1980s, and for the first time in the la for, for the first time, the producer price index, the wholesale price of textbooks, is going down. Now, there's some pr issues with the price indexes and how the Bureau of Labor Statistics does the data, but I've been really interested to see that 
nowhere since ni- uh, 1982 uh, have prices gone down, uh, but they have for the last eight months. So we'll, it will be interesting to see if that continues. Uh, but publishers are trying to find different ways to reduce their pricing and, uh, and uh, also uh, deliver materials in a different way. Uh, one of the initiatives that uh, college stores are working with, inst- with uh, publishers on is immediate access, inclusive access programs, which address the issue of making sure every student has access to materials by the first day of class. Uh, the model that our members are mostly using uh, it involves uh, neg- working with faculty and the institutions to negotiate a lower price with the publisher making sure that it's well below competitive market rates offered in used books, rental, uh, and other ways of uh, uh, students getting the materials. Uh, The students get free access to the materials, um, and they maintain free access to materials to the ad drop date, at which point they can continue and then they get charged. Uh, So the price is right there on the course, so they know what they're getting when they sign up for the course and what it will be. Students are free to opt out at any point from registration all the way to the ad drop date. Uh, So some of these initiatives at institutions like uh, San Diego State University, University of California, Davis, uh, have demonstrated uh, lower costs. The publishers like it because it it increases um, the number of students acquiring the materials, uh, and then they negotiate lower uh, lower prices. Uh, So uh, there's a lot of piloting going on. We're not sure where it will all end but there is some promise in the model if it's done the right way, uh, focused on students. Uh, Finally, NACS uh, recently announced a partnership with two publishers on uh, textbook rental programs to reduce the price of rentals, essentially bringing the publishers in as part of the process uh, so they see value in the rental program where they haven't in the past and uh, can lower their prices further. I'll just make a few quick recommendations. Um, I think one you've talked about is making sure that institutions have good uh, processes in place for adoptions and and getting faculty to turn in their adoptions. Second, they really need to take advantage of these new textbook discovery and adoption platforms. Uh, That should be part of the OER uh, mix. Um, The Z degree programs um, and some of these other initiatives around uh, are more of a top-down approach to the institution, but you need to expose faculty at all levels, many of whom are interested in OER but just don't have enough information, uh, but have shown an interest in in moving in that direction. You have to expose them. And uh, Lumen Learning, which was mentioned earlier, they announced a partnership with uh, about 1,000 college bookstores to populate their OER course uh, work into this platform because that means more faculty are going to see it and have a chance to adopt it. So uh, it has to be both a top-down and a bottom-up approach uh, to address that. Uh, So I'd like to see the system and the uh, institutions more integrating that as part of their uh, initiative. Um, Stakeholder engagement. Uh, you heard a lot about libraries. You need to have the bookstores at the table. You need to have students at the table, and you need to ensure faculty are at the table, and as well as disability support services to make sure that whether it's commercial materials or OER materials, faculty, um, that the materials are accessible to all students, which may require different formats uh, and uses and, and ways that students can consume it. OER presents a lot of opportunities there. Uh, But there's a lot of effort underway right now to make sure these materials uh, and the thought that goes into them are uh, at the same level as some of the investments publishers have made. Um, And then again, better information for students on how they can budget for uh, course materials and how they can gain access to the full spectrum of services and support from institutions. There should never be a student that drops out of uh, college uh, because of the cost of textbooks. That should not be a barrier. Uh, and and uh, there are resources available, whether they're emergency loans uh, at a number of institutions here in the, in the city and in the state, or other efforts to uh, ensure the students have access to the materials uh, they shouldn't be dropping out. So I hope that helps, and happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, and glad for your coming back again after having been at previous hearings on this topic. Uh, just 
just one point in your testimony, you say course materials are core academic costs of higher ed. The good news is that the average student nationally spends $579 in the 2016-17 school year on required materials, which is 17% lower than it was in 2007-2008 when students on average spent $701. I don't want people to uh, leave here with the impression that uh, it's it's much lower and things are going down. Uh, you refer, you're referencing course materials, which may be other items rather than just textbooks. And actually, your same organization, NACS, said the average price of a new textbook increased from $57 in 2007 to $82 in 2014. Right. And you talked about the price of used textbook. So we've been seeing an increase. And that particular one year that you cited may have been uh, something other. So I want to make sure that people understand it's been going up. Textbook costs have been going up. So I just wanted to say that. And I do have a question for you as well. When you talk about uh, open online uh, access program yeah. uh, materials, yeah. So do you think that professors are aware that uh, it requires an online access code, is that correct, and that it's only for that period of time that the course is uh, being offered, that the student has access to those materials? So access codes are effectively a delivery or purchasing method in order to obtain digital commercial content. Right. So it's not the access code per se, it's, it's the digital content, whether, that, whether that's an ebook or, or an enhanced digital ver version of a textbook, or it's some kind of software or supplemental materials that either accompany the, the textbook or more or less replace the textbook. So an access code is how, you, is how the publisher uh, um, provides the permission mm -hmm. uh, for the student to access the materials. Uh, so college stores uh, or publishers or institutions either provide or sell uh, access codes to students, and they gain access to a website or are able to download, in some cases, offline. Um, so I, I think the question really is, uh, what's, what's the nature of the digital content, where's the value of it, and how well it's being integrated into the, into the course, and then what are the terms of use? Uh, when you when you buy a digital textbook or um, anything digital, basically, you're not buying it. Um, you're buying a license to access those materials. Uh, for many of the immediate access programs that are uh, being done, some of those terms of use are being expanded within the scope of that program. So uh, many institutions have negotiated with publishers so the student has access to those materials for the full length of time they're enrolled. Um, so if they're freshmen, they would have access to that through. Others are saying, all right, this is the material you had access to at that point. We're constantly updating this content, so you, you can have it. You can have the old version. It's mm -hmm. yours. Uh, print copies are being made available for sale at very discounted rates. Uh, to students enrolled in, in some of these inclusive access as sort of an added cost. Um, so one of the things that, uh, the biggest concern I think I have, per se, is not, and if you ask students about college textbook costs, historically, and, and it's still largely true today, it's not the, pr the price which is the biggest concern the students have. Sometimes it is. It's, is it gonna be used? Why are students not obtaining their materials by the first day of class? Because a lot of students are, particularly by their, their spring semester or sophomore year, are smart enough to know, hey, I better find out if the professor is really going to use it. And what we found out in our faculty survey and our student survey is a major disconnect between the perception of faculty about the value of course materials and the student perception of that value. I mean, we asked a number of questions to each. And, you know, when I, back when I was in K-12, uh, doing K-12 policy, we talked about the achievement gap. Well, there's a, there's a value perception gap in higher ed when it comes to course materials. 
And a lot of what you were hearing in the first panel isn't necessarily about OER per se. It's about course redesign and making sure that the content that's being used in that course is being really integrated into the instruction. Um, that's part of it. Obviously, OER has other benefits to it um, and opportunities. Um, but a lot of that is about course redesign and ensuring that the materials are fully utilized. Um, and, and that was the big disconnect in the first hearing we had in 2010 about bundling. People, mm -hmm. students complained all about bundling textbooks. I bought this textbook, but I got to buy all this other stuff. I get the class, the professor hasn't even mentioned any of it. And there was this big disconnect. Why, am I being, why do I have to buy this big textbook and all this stuff and I'm not using it? Or why am I uh, buying this 600, 700 page book and we're only using four chapters? Um, so the industry has tried to address some of that. We've gone to some custom solutions which have pluses and minuses when it comes to resale. Um, but trying to tailor the contents to the specific needs of the professor and the, and the requirements of the course, that has to happen. And, uh, and I think part of what's been going on in a lot of schools that have been doing course redesign, whether it's with commercial materials or not, or OER, it's part of that trying to make sure the content fits what they're trying to do in the course. Well, I, my position is, yes, it's the value of the materials that is uh, fundamentally what we need to make sure we get. But certainly, my position is that students are concerned about the cost yep. and the price of the textbook. So, and, and most of the testimony that we've heard, students do talk about the price of the textbook. And, and we're in the same position. Okay. I mean, both Great. from trying to find ways to lower prices to uh, supporting OER. Uh, there will be a bill introduced in Congress. It was supposed to be this week. It sounds like it might get pushed the next week uh, by Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois uh, to support open educational resources. We're, uh, uh, we've worked with the Senator on the bill. We support it. Uh, we've supported it in the past Congresses. Right. We worked with Senator Schumer back in 2006, seven on a textbook rental initiative, which mm -hmm. ended up funding about $20 million to textbook rental programs and also some of the early investments in OER. Uh, so we're, we're on all of the above strategy to reducing textbook right. costs. Right. And uh, next month in Atlanta, Georgia, we have uh, our third annual textbook affordability conference uh, where we bring in um, OER folks, libraries, bookstores, faculty, administrators, student government, uh, and okay. everyone sits down over two days and, and uh, tries to really hammer out different issues. And as we talk about historically uh, those movements and issues and initiatives that have been uh, implemented to try to reduce the textbook costs, I do have to give a shout out to my predecessor, yeah. former council member Charles Barron, because he did have a was, program with Barnes and Nobles. First, that was the first hearing. Yes. <laughs> And that's where Barnes and Nobles had an agreement where they would work with a particular campus school to reduce the cost. But we do want to thank you for your testimony, um, and we look forward to working with you further. Thank you. Okay. Is the last panel? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to have uh, some students. We're going to have Jonah Kuluku come, Fatima Uusi come and Chika is here, Chika Onyanjuka. Come please and take your places at the table. Once you're seated, the council will administrate the affirmation. Good afternoon. You guys ready? Um, raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to, uh, to respond honestly to the council members' questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Hello. This is my first time um, testifying in front of the city council, so I'm, I'm really excited, kind of nervous, but um, I'll go right into what I have prepared for today. So, greetings, Honorable Committee Chairperson Barron, 
Thank you for having us here today. Can you give us your name? Yes, my name is Fatima Urruchi, and I serve as a delegate for the Thank City you. University of New York, University Student Senate, um, otherwise known as CUNY USS. Thank you. The USS is the student governance organization responsible for representing the interests of the nearly 500,000 students that attend CUNY each academic year. I'm a student at John Jay College of Criminal Justice studying English and philosophy, minoring in theater arts and interdisciplinary studies. I also have the distinct honor to serve as the president of John Jay Student Council. And in addition to that, I am a proud member of City Council District 30, which is represented by council member Elizabeth S. Crowley. So in my four years as a student at John Jay, I've heard many stories from fellow classmates and students regarding the struggles that they have under undergone in order to get to college and continue to excel while in college. Our students and their stories are what inspire me every day to work towards improving their overall college experiences. Through many conversations I've had with students, I've come to realize something rather unfortunate. And that is that one of the common denominators that I found to be at the core of students' inability to succeed is the issue of paying for textbooks. The rising costs of textbooks place an additional financial burden on our students, and those increased costs have a direct effect on student academic success. So I will recount today two instances which I can assure you are not outliers and are situations that many students at CUNY find themselves in. So um, I've changed the names for the students so that you know, we don't single out any particular student, but so Sarah was a student in my social science math class who confided in me that she was a part-time student who was living paycheck to paycheck. Um, when our professor announced to the class that the textbook for the semester would cost each person in the class a whopping $140, both of our jaws dropped. The textbook included an electronic access code to a website where we were supposed to do our math homework and in fact, the access code actually cost more than the textbook itself. Because Sarah couldn't afford to put up such a huge amount for one textbook, she ended up dropping the course and I never saw her again. So I feel that no student should ever feel like their only option in this situation is to drop the course that they're taking, a decision that may delay the continuation of a student's degree program. And this is especially true for students who are seeking to enter the STEM field and come from socioeconomic groups that traditionally do not have a major stake in STEM. So that was Sarah's story, but Sam's story is a little bit different. Sam was a student in the American Stories literature, literature course that I actually co-taught with a professor. Because Sam could not afford to buy the books that he needed for this course, and because electronic devices were not allowed in the classroom, which is typically the case in literature courses, Sam borrowed one of his classmates' books and every week would go to the library to individually scan and print every single page of every single novel that we were reading. When I finally realized what he was doing in order to save him the trouble of having to worry about such a menial thing, which I could tell was taking away from the time he put into his reading responses as the co-teacher for the course, I lent him my books because I had read them all in advance. When he didn't have to worry about making sure he had the readings for each week, the quality of his writing improved. And in the classroom, I could tell that he seemed more comfortable and willing to engage with class discussions. Perhaps not having the books was a source of embarrassment for Sam that kept him from being engaged, something which he was then able to overcome because he didn't have to worry about that anymore. So these are only two student stories, but as I stated previously, there are situations that are more common for students than you might think. And it's my hope that the City Council will do more to ensure that textbooks in higher ed remain affordable that, and that greater access to these materials be provided to students. So I want to close by thanking you all for the tremendous work that you do on behalf of members in our community and we look forward to working with you to make CUNY a place where everyone can expect access to an affordable and high quality higher education. And as for my copy of that $140 textbook, it sits buried in my closet somewhere collecting dust the access code never having been used. If only Sarah knew. Thank you, next. Greetings, Honorable Chairperson Barron. My name is Jonah Kurluku and I serve as Vice Chair of Fiscal Affairs for the City University of New York University Student Senate, also known as CUNY USS. USS is the student governance organization responsible for representing the interests of nearly 500,000 students that attend CUNY each academic year. I currently attend Lehman College with a major in exercise science and mathematics. I'm also a proud member of the City Council District number 32. 
Um, among other barriers to completing a college degree, income is a leading factor that can hinder a student from reaching their full potential. The average 2016 graduate accumulates 30, about $37,000 in debt. In 2012, 71% of students, that is about 1.3 million individuals, graduated from a four-year college with debt. Graduate students owe about 57,000 on average, not reflecting any other debt that they accumulated while an undergrad. The City University of New York has historically been in a special position to offer low-income students an opportunity to receive a quality education at an affordable price. Unfortunately, throughout the years, tuition at CUNY has risen along with other mandatory costs that are required for students to actively participate in class. A study conducted by the U.S. Government Accountability Office in 2013 found that textbook costs rose about 82 percent from 20, 2002 to 2012. And textbooks now are costing students roughly $100 to $400 for books that are often just used for one class and just for one semester. Some classes require multiple books, as um, other testimonies have shown. It is wrong to interpret the narrative that the afflictions of poverty are eliminated when a low-income student enters college. Students drop out due to the financial strain they're feeling not only at school but also at home. Governor, Governor Cuomo barely attempted to solve these systemic issues through the Excelsior Scholarship. This last dollar scholarship takes financial aid away from our most needy students that can be used towards transportation, books, fees, and other school-related bills. For graduate students, even less resources are available. And to add to the financial crisis most students are facing, CUNY recently raised their tuition. And not only did the federal government just eliminate a program that would mitigate the debt students are accumulating, they are actively taking steps to underfund public education. And um, from the testimonies that I heard earlier, I would just like to add something about open resource textbooks and that um, they should not compromise the quality of our education because some students um, feel that some of the textbooks being used do not include all the information that previous textbooks were were used, and also, um, as my co um, colleague mentioned, some classes have online components that, although free textbooks are being used, it negates the purpose because an access code can cost just as much or even more than the textbook um, that was eliminated. And um, virtual bookstores are not necessarily something that all students want, especially because um, CUNY has a population of students that are non-traditional, sometimes older, and are accustomed to a different way of learning. And so um, although virtual text uh, bookstores are a good option, they should not be the only option. And that um, the shipping costs associated with the uh, virtual bookstores sometimes affect the ability of a student to receive those books by the first day of class. And so now, more than ever, we need our brightest people working to solve these problems affecting the students of New York. And USS is calling on legislators to pass and sign a bill that will begin a task force on private student loans, refinancing, and um, efforts to reduce textbook costs. Thank you for all the work that you do on behalf of m members in our community. And we look forward to working with you to make CUNY a place where everyone can attain a higher education. Thank you. Next. Greetings, Honorable Chairperson uh, Barron and Honorable Council Members. My name is Chico Nyajikwa, and I serve as a chairperson of the City University of New York's University Student Senate, also known as CUNY USS. I am a proud recent graduate of Hunter College, having studied community health education, and I'm a proud resident of City Council District 27, represented by Council Member Danique Miller. My colleagues today have detailed to you the plight of a CUNY student. The cost of textbooks, coupled with the out-of-reach costs of tuition and expenditures, have disenfranchised many students from attaining a quality and affordable education. We are here today to call on the council to take the following measures. One, CUNY students asked the New York City Council to adopt Resolution 1559, calling on the governor, calling on Governor Cuomo 
and the state legislature to enact into law refinancing of student loans and developing a refinancing student loans task force. Two, tuition continues to rise, but there is less financial aid available to cover books and transportation. CUNY students asked the New York City Council to call on the state to reform the Tuition Assistance Program, TAP, in four ways. Number one, removing the one-year full-time eligibility requirement so that more students are eligible for full-time TAP. Number two, to amend the Excelsior Scholarship Program to a first dollar so that students can use TAP and Pell Grants to cover books and transportation costs. Number three, extend the number of semesters students receive TAP so transfer students can complete their degrees without running out of financial aid. And number four, on behalf of our undocumented students, asking them to please pass the New York State Dream Act so our students can have the real leadership that they need more now than ever. Three, students ask the New York City Council to write a letter to the New York State Legislature and Governor requesting that they adopt amendments to the Get On Your Feet student loan program to include graduate student loan debt. Number four, CUNY students ask the New York City Council to continue to provide funding for the City Council Merit Scholarship. And five, CUNY students ask that the New York City Council request the state freeze tuition for the, new, for the next two academic years because our students deserve a break. I would be remiss if I didn't take time to thank each and every member of this committee who continues to work tirelessly to ensure that the City University of New York has the resources we need to educate and to succeed. Thank you for your time. Thank you much. I appreciate you coming. And just a few comments. Um, you talked about um, Ms. Iruchi. Mm -hmm. You talked about co-teaching. Yes. I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that sure. experience. Um, so I co-taught with a professor in the English department. Um, it was a hybrid course. And so um, for most of the school work was done online, and we met once a week during the actual semester. And for me, that was a very transformative <coughs> experience because as an undergraduate student, you don't get many opportunities mm -hmm. to see what it's like to be a professor um, and to experience academia in that light. And so I got a chance to you know, create my own course folder based off of research that I did independently that I got to teach to the students um, through online and, and in person. Um, and that's an opportunity that I think more students at the undergraduate level definitely need. Um, it's part of, it should be something that's a part of the experiential learning um, component to higher education. So that, that's something that meant a lot to me as a student. And there's more comments I can make on the things that have passed before us today, but I want to toss it back to you for whatever comments you have. <laughs> and, and what school was that at? What campus? John Jay. At John Jay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and the hybrid course was, what was the title of the course? Um, it know? was American Stories, uh, but the course code was Literature 233, I believe. Okay. That's so not good. I taught it as an, it was an independent study for me, so it was a um, 300 level for me, but I co-taught. <coughs> Great, thanks. And uh, Chica, mm -hmm. uh, thank you once again for the leadership that you provided. And once again, we always know that, you know, USS comes before us and they have a plan, they have a vision, and we're so in, excited to be able to continue to work with you in that regard. And I don't think that I have any other questions. I want to keep you encouraged and keep the relationship and the communications open. Thank you so much for coming and Thank you for testimony. having us. Um, Thank Council you. Council Member, if, yes. if you don't mind, if I could just say some more words. If, sure. Um, so going back to the OER topic, um, something that mm -hmm. Jonah touched on that is very pertinent to our students is the fact that those virtual textbook mm -hmm. stores are not always the best thing that works for students. You know, John Jay College was the first college to move from the brick and mortar bookstore to the virtual system. And since then, I've heard so many complaints from students that they don't you know, they don't use the, that source. For myself, I've used it maybe twice, and both times the textbooks have come in late, or the shipping costs have been higher than the 
actual cost of textbooks. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's easier to get on the train and get my ass to the, the Strand and pick up books from there than to have to worry about getting them over the virtual online bookstore because they might come in two months into the semester or I might be paying over $50 for it just shipping alone. So that's one thing that is important about it. But more than anything, I want to talk about the communal val value that the bookstores actually give to our college communities because bookstores are more than just about the books. You can go to the bookstore and you can pick up utensils, you can pick up notebooks, you can pick up apparel for your college, and it's about school, community, and spirit as well. You know, John Jay got rid of theirs, Brooklyn College got rid of theirs last year, and their student newspaper actually released a article that very much highlighted the student negative reaction to what was happening with the bookstore. And so I would really hope that the city council takes that um, information into consideration um, when it comes to this kinds of stuff. Uh, one thing that I did want to note also on top of that was something a very nice professor of mine did for students this semester regarding textbooks. He actually had a partnership with the publisher of, of this particular textbook that he wanted to use for our course. And instead of pulling the entire textbook for the course, which was supposed to cost about $200, made that partnership and was able to get USBs for everyone in the class for $40 mm -hmm. each. Now, the one downside to that is the professor actually had to put up the money himself. So let's say a student drops the course, that professor ends up being unable to pay off that mm -hmm. full bill. But that is something that this professor did out of his own concern for student affordability costs with textbooks. And I think something that we should talk about, like Jonas said, is these other ways to look at what affordability looks like with textbooks, mm -hmm. and maybe private and public partnerships with those publishing companies can be one of those ways. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and certainly it speaks to, as you started out talking about, the yeah. uniqueness of individual learning styles mm -hmm and not any one program or plan fits everyone, and we need to make sure that as we're uh, designing this materials that we're cognizant of that fact. Uh, I love a book to hold in my hand, to see the words. I get a few things online, but I prefer a book, so we certainly have to respect people's individual learning styles. And we're glad to know that there are instructors such as the one that you referenced who are not only concerned about uh, the cost to students, but is willing to go into his own pocket yeah. and provide that. So thank you so much. Thank you. And seeing no other uh, testimony, we're going to conclude this hearing. Thank you so much.